All right, I think we're going to get started. Thanks for coming. My name is Ryan Wilson. I'm the marketing coordinator here. <coughs> um, we got a busy week here at the library. Tonight, of course, we've got Morels with Scott, who is, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, later on this week, Wednesday, we have a really cool movie. We uh, get free screeners of documentaries every month from ITVS, PBS, actually, and it's independent cinema, and we're showing a film called Strong, and it's about the most accomplished woman in weightlifting history. Um, that's on Wednesday. We're going to have a guest host who talks a little bit about the athlete's body and how the athlete has to make that decision at some point whether or not to continue with her profession or, or move on depending on what the body can take. And so we'll have a professional athlete here talking about that whole situation. So if, you, if you're interested in weightlifting, if you're interested in how we kind of perceive the basic body type, this is a really interesting film. Um, it should be an interesting discussion. And again, that is premiered here before anywhere else. Um, so definitely keep that in mind on Wednesday at 6 o'clock. Thursday, um, we have Reading Science. If you're a science buff, which some of you may be if you're interested in mushrooms, uh, we have a person in our library who talks about different science breakthroughs that are coming out. And he uses two journals. One is the journal Nature and one is the journal Science. So these are very scientific journals, but he breaks them down and he talks about he cr tries to create a discussion. The topic for this week is um, the Great Unconformity. So if you're interested in geology, definitely mark your calendars for Thursday at 6 p.m. and that'll be up in the Telluride room. And that's really just an informal discussion, trying to get people who are interested in science to come out for that particular particular evening. So that's 6 on Thursday. Now, medium, um, medium room. Yep, yeah, medium, medium room. Okay, medium, medium, medium room. Um, and then Friday, you might have seen a poster out here, uh, we're having a person named Jeff Goble who's coming into town to talk about creating common ground or building common ground and and choosing to be civil in, in this contentious world that we live in, I guess, these days. And he's going to be leading three different workshops. Um, if you're interested in any of the workshops, take a look at the poster out there. There's a, all we ask is if you are SVP, because there'll be some food, there'll be some other things involved. But it's completely free, and if you're interested in learning how to be really civil with each other, it's a great workshop. Um, but tonight, oh, well, I should mention one other really important one. On Saturday, Wild Earth Guardians are coming in, and they're bringing two, speaking of civility, <laughs> they're bringing in two researchers who have studied prairie dogs. And they're going to be talking about prairie dogs all day on, from like 3.30 on Saturday all the way to about 8.45, 9 o'clock. Um, so that should be a really interesting discussion as well. Um, these are people who have worked in the field and they're going to talk about the prairie dog colony. Scott, who is the newly acquainted, or no, what's the word I'm looking for? Appointed. Newly appointed director of the Shroom Fest. Now he's in charge of everything. Art has handed over the reins to Scott, which uh, he's very capable reins. I've known Scott for a while. He knows his mushrooms backwards and forwards. Um, he's running the Shroom Fest this year. He's teaching a class. If you're interested in taking the Mushroom Festival, yes, you can take the Mushroom Festival for credit this year, which is pretty amazing. Um, so uh, every month, Scott comes and gives us some more little fascinating tidbits about mushrooms. And tonight, he's going to talk a little bit about morels and some of the people that are coming to the festival. So I'll hand it over to Scott. Thanks, Ryan. Welcome, you guys. Uh, I, like Ryan said, I'm Scott Cook. I'm the director of the Mushroom Festival. And tonight, I was really going to talk about morels. Yeah. And, you know, we've got this massive morel season upon us right now and everybody's finding them everywhere really? Um, <laughs> <they are>. really? <laughs> we have a little bit of a drought uh so i'm going to talk about prairie dogs <laughs> <laughs> no um so this is the uh elusive morel that we were all in search of and um you know until tonight I hadn't heard of many of them being found yet this year, and so far this year, I'd heard of only like a couple dozen being found, and it sounds like there's 
seven more that have been found. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody here found morels yet this year? Nobody? You guys have the inside line. You have found one, no. Michael? Can, can, uh, can you show us a false morel? No, I am not showing false morels tonight because question. tonight we're talking about morel. <laughs> but I do have pictures of false morels and maybe later um, Maybe later I can pull some out. No, just uh, just, uh, just, uh, just, uh, just, uh, just for ID purposes. Yeah. Yeah, I could pull out something like that. Um, so Good I just wanted to show you guys just a few, just a few little pictures of what it looks like around here when you do find them. It would be nice to have a basket like wow. this, this yeah. year, mm -hmm. or like that, mm. or like that. Stop. Okay, I'll stop. It's, it's paused. <coughs> so, uh, this this particular mushroom is called Morchella esculenta, and it's the blonde morel. Um, it's it's more commonly seen here than the black one that you guys were talking about earlier. Um, and the shape of the black one has a little bit more of a pointy tip to it. I, I have th I only found one of those last year, so. Hmm. It's been a it's been pretty interesting to go out hunting for morels and I just wanted to give you guys just a few pointers today on where to look for those things if if you are out there. Some of you guys have been hunting for them for years and already have your favorite hmm. spots and new people new to it might have a difficult time trying to find these because you, a lot of the time when you're uh, looking for mushrooms it's pattern recognition. You're looking for a shape, a form, something that strikes you and you find it more, t more often because you're looking for that pattern in the landscape. And it's just a little different in some cases than the landscape itself. So in this case, these little guys are really close to the river. Like this year, they might be really close to the river because the river is the source of water and it's not raining right now so it's very dry if you go out and dig in the soil um, in that cut bank above the river it's dry mm -hmm. it's really dry if you dig down deep enough you might find a little bit of something there or if you find a place that has leaves or some kind of mulchy material over the top of the surface you might end up finding a little bit more moisture so um, I would suggest looking near places that have water um, there's a lot of information out there. Um, I use a lot of different books to find out, you know, maybe little niches or things like that that might exist um, for me when I'm looking for mushrooms. But when I'm trying to find information about a habitat type for mushrooms, I use different books. And I have a bunch of books that I use. I'm going to show you guys a couple of the books. I brought most of these books last time. Um, they all pretty much have the same information except one of them. So I will show you them. Um, the first one is All That the Rain Promises by David Rora. It's an excellent book. Uh, it's really small and easy to put in your pocket and walk around and carry with you. And so, like, I know there's a lot of beginners in here and there's a lot of experienced users of, of these handbooks, but um, these field guides are really excellent for helping you identify or come up with the taxonomy for these mushrooms on the macroscopic or the, mi the macro level. Um, Mushrooms of Colorado. This is an excellent book as well. It's specific to the state that we're in, but we live in a unique niche here in the San Juans. It's got a little bit different thing going on, but um, if, you, if you look in this book, most of the mushrooms that you find around here will be in this book, so it's really, really nice. <coughs> and it says the Southern Rocky Mountains, by the way. Um, North American Mushrooms, this book here by Orson Miller is I know that there I've mentioned this before and people are ah oh, you're using so and so's book and I, I love this book because it has a lot of really cool pictures and it has scientific names in here um, not common names so if if you're used to using the word morel that earlier you were talking to the woman behind you and you said you were talking about morels and then I showed this picture of a blonde morel and you were like, well, that's not the one I was talking about. I, I want the black morel. And so um, the common names are really confusing. And this one doesn't have that problem because it really doesn't Who's the talk author of that? It. Orson Miller. You can, I can hand it to you. 
This book is very difficult to find, but if you have a friend who has it, it has illustrations inside the Mushrooms and Telluride. This is a collaborative effort of people that have been intimately involved with the Mushroom Festival over the years and the people that started the Mushroom Festival. So it's a really awesome book. Um, with illustrations, it also uses Gary Linkoff's kitchen in here for the edible ones, and he talks about the different ways you can prepare it or things you can use it for. Um, and this book right here is, I think it's out of print, so it's very difficult to yeah, find. I don't believe they have even have it at the library. Yeah, I, I bought this one, I think like 10 years ago, so. But between the covers can go track down out mm. of print. Yeah, so yeah. you might be able to find those on the web somewhere too. Or mm -hmm. between the covers. Mm -hmm. I saw one in the back of a broke down car in, <laughs> in the mountains uh -huh. out here, so. Is that where you got yours? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I purchased this one. Um, and then this book right here is really pertinent. Um, Paul Stamets wrote this book. It's Growing Gourmet and Medicinal Mushrooms. Um, there's another one, The Mushroom Cultivator. Um, these talk more specifically about the growth parameters necessary, the optimum growth parameters necessary for mushrooms to grow, um, for the mycelium to grow, and for the formation of the food and bodies, you know. So, uh, it, in using this book, um, it's a little bit more technical than a lot of people probably need, but it actually will give you a little bit more of a head start if you're really into collecting mushrooms and you're looking for morels this year and you were like wondering when the first day it could actually happen was, if you were taking the soil temperature for the last month, you would know when that day would have likely have been. And so it's a pretty interesting, pretty interesting book to use for that purpose. So if you guys want to take a look at these, I'll have these. I can pass them around as long as they just end up back up here. We're good. Yes? What's the name of the one, the Telluride one? The te it's called Wild Mushrooms of Telluride. Okay. Yeah. That's an excellent book. Yeah, you can pass them around if you'd like. Um, so, morels. You guys were in a in a really interesting conversation. You I mean, did you find any? It's as soon as you put the word morels onto the billboard, everybody was going to be here. And Ryan did a really good job. He's the marketing manager. He knows the words to choose for <laughs> <laughs> the right topic for the evening. So. Um, Nobody's found morels this year. Uh, I've looked in a lot of environments that are in the same area. For instance, Bear Creek, um, just where the cot or aspens are near the water, um, mixed conifer. Mm -hmm. and Have you had luck in the up in the, higher in the mountains there looking for that? No. No, I my haven't. husband just went to Lizard Head Pass. Um, and he didn't find any. Yeah. I found some in Utah. You found oh, some in yeah. Utah. Utah. Really? Utah. Wow, that's, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Was it growing in that's grass? Like, oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I would imagine there's a little bit more niches for growth in there and like the canyons around there and stuff. That's cool. And in the parks, I think, maybe even. Because they irrigate and there's water there. So, yeah. So, um,. This year has kind of been a dry year. A friend of ours found ten, another guy found what a dozen. What did what did John find out in year A? None. No, Mel. Maybe it's early. Oh. He he said he found some too. Yeah, he found a few out there. So I don't know what to do. Uh, what would this a year. typical I've, season be? I don't know. Last year, um, my friend John and I went out and we found pounds of them. Like what time of the year? That was like June, the beginning of June. Well, maybe it's still too early. It could be a little early. Oh, that's right. Right. It's early this year. Mm -hmm. no, no, but because uh, because because the path flowers just decided to uh, to start start blooming. Yeah, there's uh, there's a lot of like adages like if the 
oak leaves are the size of a mouse's ear or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> just like, all right, well, I don't know what mouse you're talking about. But like, <laughs> it's a really big mouse. Um, um, the, the other thing is I think there's a lot of different parameters that have to be met. One is like the minimum soil temperature has to be around 40 degrees, and it has to maintain that. Um, with like daytime temperatures on like 40 to 60, 40 to 70 here probably, 40 to 60 in the northwest, um, something like that. And it and the uh, it would have to be like that for a few weeks, like probably about three weeks for it to actually produce fruit. And one of the things that coincides with us normally finding them is moisture. We get a little burst of moisture. We get a lot of moisture in the spring. That kind of creates a lot of soil moisture and deep down there would be soil moisture and on the surface there would be soil moisture and in the top two to four inches which is the most important there would be soil moisture and there just isn't and the the morel mushrooms grow from sclerotia so they basically have these concentrated um, little granules that are in the soil and that's where the mycelium sprouts from so if we were to get some good moisture, I would say that would be a great time for us to look for them. But at the same time, it's been so dry that maybe the mycelium are past their prime for, for doing some production of fruits. Um, the other is they um, talk about burn areas. You could actually cultivate morels if you, want, if you wanted to. Um, you can mix like peat moss with um, with uh, like ashes from your fireplace and then put those in an area with the mycelium, like you can buy mycelium. I'll talk about somebody who actually is growing these and has the mycelium. Um, but he, you can mix them and create that or create a place that you could, with that mixture, spread it out in an area, create shade, make sure it's thoroughly watered. Let the mycelium grow out for the summer. Next spring, if you have enough moisture, you can water it to keep that moisture, that's the key. Um, or put a little mulch over it or something so that it creates that space um, for optimum growing conditions. But you could grow them in your backyard. So if you love them enough and you wanted to put a little bit of love into your garden, there's a there are ways to do it. And so, like last week, I showed you methods, or last month, sorry, I showed you methods on how to grow oyster mushrooms in your garden or in a permaculture type landscape. Um, there's ways to do the same thing with morels if you're, if you're willing to put the effort in there and go the extra you know, mileage for making that happen. Is there a yes. specific side, like the south facing side, um, like pines or north end of a tree? moisture area or I mean is it do I, they like specific direction I've had success looking around cottonwoods cottonwoods mm -hmm. yeah usually cottonwoods live in more moist soil conditions they suck up so much water that they need to be in a place that they can do that and so if you um, if you're thinking about the tree itself that you're going to let's say you're going to uh, a place like Uray and you go to a place where they've cut off irrigation to a place, it's not likely to be moist enough for production of mushrooms. If they cut off, if you see like dead and dying trees around the area, that's where they used to have irrigation and the trees are dying off and so, you know, those places used to be suitable but probably aren't anymore. So taking that into consideration would be probably a good thing. Um, I, I say burn area or the ashes because another way, another place that's common is in burn areas. If you go, like your family in Montana, if they go to one of the big burn areas, I love seeing the pictures of what people find out there in the summer. Like in the middle of the summer, I think it's August, probably July or August, they get some massive like backpack fulls and like grocery sacks full of the paper garbage bags or paper uh, grocery sacks. So there's, you know, those places are more optimum for finding them. I, in the upper Midwest, the Midwest, the Southeast, the Eastern Seaboard, there's a lot of places where morels grow really well and are more suited to that environment. And those places have more humidity. Yeah. The temperature is more constant. Um, 
once that minimum temperature goes up high enough that the soil can gain that heat and hold that heat and stay at like 40 degrees or more, that's when it would start happening. And that they have more constant. They don't have the big temperature swings there that we do here. This time of year, we can see a 40 degree temperature swing in a day or 30, 30 to 40 degrees. So that's, that's a lot of temperature range and it makes it for a very difficult place. So there's optimum locations you know, a riparian area has more humidity. Humidity water um, holds heat better and will keep the temperature more constant. So if you're down in a stream drainage, the temperature changes are a lot, are a lot uh, less drastic than let's say an open dry area on top of some rocks or whatever. So keeping those types of things in mind are really important little, you know, notes to keep in your mind. And then if you do find one, it's really, some people just pick it and then they go off and they make their dinner, but if you find one, mark in your mind where you found it because it's probably going to be there next year, another one, you know, or another two because they like to grow in twins um, a lot of times. Um, the other thing is take note of what you just said, like what's the aspect? Is it a south facing slope? Is it under a pine? I've found them under Douglas firs out here, like really well like in the Douglas fir areas but Douglas firs grow in kind of north facing stuff and in places that have a little bit more um, cooler temperatures so it's a little bit different. So does any, is anybody have any questions right now about these? Yes. I do. What do they taste like? Oh. 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 They taste terrible. Oh my yeah. god. <laughs> I don't even know why anybody goes like that. I did that. <laughs> they're they're um, delicious. There's a version that I've only seen um, so far in Michigan, close to her house, and uh, it's Morcella deliciosa, and it's. It's got like white on the outside and it's darker in the pits. Um, there's this version here, and then there's the black version, and then there's the Crisipes, which is like the Bigfoot. Um, and I would say that, I, I don't know, like these ones, I've eaten, obviously I've eaten a lot of them, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what would you say is like the, dip, the taste between like a black morel and a blonde morel? I'm talking to the gal in the back. Are you talking to me? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Ellie, sorry. Okay, a blonde morel, per, in my opinion, is, is nuttier and earthier um, versus the black. Uh, yeah, there's kind of a richness in the black morel that's different. It's kind yeah. of a buttery, maybe, instead of a nuttery. <laughs> to me, a black morel would <laughs> taste like a filet, high end filet yeah. steak. Mm. No. There we go. Very buttery, very rich. Mm. Have you found one yet this year? Nope. No? <laughs> so I'm here. Me oh, you really are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's long. Well, okay. Um, okay, so, question. and you had another question. Okay. Um, I'm not used to looking for mushrooms in the spring. Do these grow in the fall as well? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They could grow in the fall someplace else, maybe in the mountains of the northwest or something, depending on what the moisture happens like. But I, no, they're mostly in the spring. Um, it usually they're in the spring, like starting about now and going into June um, for like that window. There's like like you were saying, it's about three week window or something like that. And it, you know, one of the cool things that we have going for us here is that we have elevation differences. And so um, they start at lower elevations and as the season gets warmer and warmer and warmer, it, it goes up in elevation. And so maybe, um, I haven't ever found one in Telluride, in Telluride or above Telluride, so I don't, that's just me. Other people may have it, but I've focused my efforts in other places. So you can't grow. You can't grow them in your garden. Well, yeah. 
You mm -hmm. you can't morels? You could. You just, you just there's certain parameters mm -hmm. you need to meet, but you yeah, yeah, there's like a mix of like uh peat and oh. ash. Um you could take like an old fire pit from your backyard mm -hmm. or wherever you have a fire pit and kind of put it in there, but you can't have a fire after you do that. <laughs> but you have to introduce the mycelium in those locations. So um, that would mean buying like a kit, some kind of gallon of mushroom spawn and taking you that. You can buy that in. commercially? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. wow. This mushroom has very, very, very aggressive mycelium. Mm -hmm. And they expand at a rate of something like, I, from one of those books, I think it said something like four inches a day. So the, the mycelium just grows really rapidly. Um, in a Petri dish, it grows really fine gray hairs, and then it just booms out and just turns more of a, a dark, deep, deep, deeper color of gray, brownish. Yeah? To um, sustain a patch of mushrooms like this, do you recommend cutting them and leaving the base, or do you take the whole thing? Or well, that's the best way. I, I break them off like that because I don't want to disturb the soil too much. Right. Um, one of the things that can happen, so I, I cultivate mushrooms. I have a, a mushroom lab that I work in and it's just my kitchen. I had showed pictures of it last month. Um, there's, um, if you disrupt the soil, then you could potentially bring in outside bacteria and viral contaminants to the mycelium. And so um, that can be one thing that can hinder growth or cause some problems in the mycelial landscape of the forest. The other thing that can happen is maybe you just damage the mycelium too much and it just can't recover from that. Let's say it's really dry, but um, there is one thing you can do, and you can, if you do disturb the soil and you do get the root ball off of these things, the little wide spot at the base of it, you can um, put those and do a burrito style thing with it. And I'll, I'm gonna show a video on that with a different mushroom, but I'm gonna show you a video on that later, um, how you can accomplish that. And that's one way to introduce it into your garden if you're gonna do it. Um, you would have to try to meet the other parameters like having some kind, the easiest way would be to have some kind of like um, already combusted wood or something like that that would be in there or ash or something so that you could make that happen. Does that answer kind of what you were talking about? But I would like to visualize a, a false Morale versus a real morale. <coughs> Visual, okay, let's close our eyes. <laughs> um, a false morale, um, one of the types of false morales that, uh, that you encounter out here is um, gyrometra. And it, ha it looks kind of like a brown glob, like a brown, I have a picture here. You, th thank you. <laughs> this is the false. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the things I um, try to let people know is if if you do encounter that mushroom, one of them, one of them is just poisonous straight out. The other, you can they say you can cook out the um, the jet fuel that's in there uh, because that's part of the problem with those, that's why they mm -hmm. caution you with those, is that they have, um, God, I can't remember what the name of it is right now, but uh, the jet fuel is what? Mono, you got fuel. Hydrazine or yeah, something. Th 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 thyrosine. <laughs> thyrosine, okay, monomethylthyrosine. It has, you can cook that out um, if you do it, and there's been cases of the people that are cooking them getting ill, mm -hmm. but you know, I've heard of people saying that that's their favorite mushroom to eat oh, and whatever. And who knows? Well, you love that black one. <laughs> so, you know, everybody has their favorites, but um, I would say stick with these guys. The difference here is that these have, um, let me go back. I'll show you that close up. I took this uh, hunting with Ellie one day up in Michigan. Um, there's, um, there's ridges 
defined ridges there. It looks kind of net-like, and it has pits in the surface. If you were to cut it in half, it would be hollow. Do you remember seeing those pictures before? The stem is hollow. Mm -hmm. Right inside mm -hmm. there, this little spot right there, it's hollow. Um, also, this uh, stem down there is going to be about, I don't know, an inch, inch and a half, maybe two inches, just depending on how big the mushroom is. Um, and then the head will get up to two and a half, maybe to three or four inches for just this style of this uh, species of mushrooms or mushroom. Um, in addition, it's connected. The cap is one piece. It's attached to the center. So if you were to imagine like a, the finger being hollow, the mushroom would be attached at the base of this and come up and around and around and it's completely attached inside too. And the pits go all the way down to that center hollow piece. The other mushrooms, like the gyrometra mushroom that you were just looking at, the cap isn't attached except in one spot and it's, and it's just kind of convoluted and draped around the stalk. And the shape of it is generally just a weird blob growing in an area. It's not really that, um, that well formed. That said, mushrooms can take multiple forms in the same in the same species, and so you know, look, uh, where is a good one in here? These guys, some of them have like frosty tops on them, so they're kind of interesting. But um, this one's more rounded; it's not as elongated like this one here. This one's elongated. Notice that it makes an arc in its shape here as opposed to straight, more linear. So when you find them, you might find them growing out from underneath a log, or you might find them growing under some like leafy debris or something, pushing it up, and you might be able to find like a little mushroom or something. But these mushrooms grow really fast, and they come up like that. And if you were to come back the next day, they'd still be about the same size. They wouldn't really grow like a chanterelle, which can double in size from day to day. So. They're, they're much more different than, than other mushrooms. Are there any other questions about morels around here? Your favorite way to cook them? Well, that's a good question. I, I kind of experiment with different ways of cooking them, but you know, th I've heard that like, don't put them in butter and garlic, and I think butter and garlic tastes great with these things. So <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> that's one way. Or just saute, just sautéing them, you know, for like 10 or 15 minutes in some olive oil with just a little fresh herbs or something on them. They do need a little oil, unlike the I think so, yeah, because then the texture when you're done cooking it is a little different than like if you were to dry fry them like a chanterelle where the water comes out of them. The water's still going to come out of these. Like when they're really moist, I guess one thing that we have in our favor is that these mushrooms, even though they can get parasitized by nematodes and other insects and whatever else out there, they... Um, we have such a great climate that it just tends to dry in its form. And you might get there and see this mushroom that you could still eat, <laughs> but it's dried. It's been dried by the air here, whatever. So once they come out of the ground, they start to dry. And they get, you can tell, like that last picture there is in an environment that's probably close to 70 or 80 percent humidity outside at that time when I picked it. But um, the ridges are still wide and I don't know how you'd say it, luscious or delicious looking or whatever. And as they get, if it dries out or desiccates, the ridges become very fine little ra razor sharp ridges of just like uh, and browned a little bit as they dry so mm -hmm. it changes a little bit and you'll be able to tell that usually starts from the top down and the outside inside so uh, although now I, I I know beliefs if they're bigger than probably this uh, they're, they're probably not worth gathering great now, 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, well, because uh, because because beliefs tend to get filled up with worms. Worms. 
Yeah. Yes, and and and, and fly larva. Right, and so, and and, and 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 so, is there a size where these aren't, aren't worth gathering? You'll know when you pick them. Mm -hmm. um, they're like little insects hide in the pits, and um, I learned a trick from Ellie's dad: like soak them in salt water for 15 minutes before, and it, the bugs will just like come out of the pits and. Um, that's great, is, is and I love bugs. Add protein, so you okay. can <laughs> you can eat those and have higher protein morale. Okay, cool. Yeah. Are there is 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 there a size in morels that 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 indicate they're, they're it, it leave it to 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 spore out? I would suggest just leave them all. <laughs> <laughs> tell me where you found it, and I'll tell you what size is a good size. Um, actually, uh, no. I, I think you just, the ones you find are the sizes that were meant for you. Is that a bug on the bottom right leaf? Oh, uh, no. with the legs? Good question. See it? Oh, yeah. Are you talking about that? Yep. Looks Look at like the legs. Looks kind of <laughs> like it, know. doesn't it? <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> All right. Are there any further questions about morels? Are you guys, uh, so if, you if it snows in the next couple of weeks or whatever, I would suggest going out and looking because that creates a good percolation of water through the soil. Um, it increases soil moisture in that top layer really well. If we get enough moisture that it starts to get into the deeper layers, maybe in our normal season would be a great time to look for it because it could still be um, early for this year. But the temperatures right now are really high for, for morale formation down lower in the valley. They're kind of past their prime down there. But up here. If you cultivated them manually, do they like to shady area, sunny, or both? I would create shade because part of the issue with what we have here is the if you create shade you're probably creating more moisture or more humidity in the soils in that area so it's it's essential to do that yeah. okay. and from what I've seen like different outside growing styles or inside growing styles most of them have like a controlled light source or if it's outside they do have a little shade structure like out in the middle of the field or something um, or if you were to grow them under trees, if you were to select mm -hmm. the appropriate trees, like a cottonwood would be a good one. Or maybe even try an aspen or an alder or a Douglas fir or something like that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yes? This is a general mushroom question, and you probably all know this, but um, so in general, it, you, um, you never root the root ball of a mushroom, you, you leave that, even a um, folate? Well, I, um, I tend to cut everything, yeah. just to not disturb as much stuff. Well, but the spores come out of the gills, or the mycelium is what So this is an ascomycete, and it propels them out of the, kind of the pity area there and on the surface. Um, in a bolete, you have these little pore surfaces and that's where the the spores get ejected from and on like a rusula or something or an amanita you they would be off of the gills um, if you're unsure about a mushroom what it is you pick the whole thing you go down to the base of it you you pull up the base of it to know what it is for example the amanita is a really good example of that um, the base of it has a bulb and if you know that it's an amanita, because you looked at the base of it and found that bulb, then that's only the only way you can actually do that is to dig that out. So just grab it with your hands and pull it out. If the stem was to break, I would pull it out just to make sure. And so the reason you would do that is if you, let's say you found a white amanita, that has white throughout. It's white all over. The gills are white. The stem is white. It's white spores and everything. Um, you wouldn't want to eat that because that would be the one of the most deadly mushrooms on the planet. So, 
Um, and the only way you would be able to first identify it by its macroscopic features is by knowing that it had a bowl on the base of it. If you already know the mushroom, you can cut it. If it's like a bolete, I know people like to pick them and then shave the bases off of them. I like to do that too. Um, but it's a mycorrhizal species with the spruces and other conifers, so it's necessary to, you know, try to create minimal disturbance so that, like I was talking about, the mycelium don't get disrupted and we don't have these issues with contamination or things like that. In the, but mostly wild mushrooms have already encountered these types of pathogens and issues in their environment. Cool. Is, it, is should, should we keep our knives and tools clean? Well, that that we use for for mushrooms is that to maybe not introduce as many pathogens into. That would be one way. Yeah, sure. I think it's well, it's probably water. not too necessary mm -hmm. when you're cutting the stem, just because of its location outside of the mycelial mm -hmm. area. But yeah. Mm -hmm. That's one way you could possibly do it. Cool. Um, I want to move on to the next thing. And uh, the next thing is Shroom Fest. This is with, with they call, with, I wouldn't want Art to be jealous, but one of the patron saints of the festival here, <laughs> Gary Linkoff. Um, and last year he actually dressed up as the Amanita. Let's see if we can find that. I think I have it. And uh, I think they won a, a they won a costume award for that That's last so year. <laughs> so um, notice that in the picture that on the right side, this is an amanita. It's got the little bulb at the base of it. Um, amanitas are really interesting mushrooms. They grow everywhere. We have several different types around here. If you look in these books, there's pages and pages and pages and you know species and of amanitas. They're everywhere. The big uh, amanita muscaria, the one that everybody knows, the Alice in Wonderland mushroom, the red with white dots. Mm -hmm. So he's definitely playing out his amanita dreams there. Um, the these guys here. Um, did a great job trying to show destroying the angles. Here. Yeah, angels. angels. I know they oh, say oh. angles there. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't actually notice that. Until you saw that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. <laughs> He's hanging out with his angles. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, good eye. Uh, so this is one of the features that you see, and amanitas come from an egg. They grow in the soil, they push up out of the soil, and it initially looks like a white egg or an egg of some sort. And then as it grows, it stretches out, it get elongates, it breaks out of this little bottom part, the, the top of the mushroom starts to open, and it leaves a little ring right there on the on the mushroom stem. And then as it grows, that white cocoon that it was in separates and it leaves little white patch marks all <coughs> over the top of it. So if you do see a mushroom that is in an egg shape and you cut it in half, the inside of one of those will be white on the outside. It'll have like a like a amanita mascara, it'll have like a red line on the inside where the red part of the cap would be. And you'd be able to see a little bit of the gill features as you cut through the half of it. I would cut from the top to the bottom, not sideways. Um, and then you'll be able to see the whole base of it kind of in a cocoon. It's really an interesting thing to take a look at. If, if you cut one, how do you clean your knife before you <laughs> That's what well, I was going to say. Be happy, be happy, be happy before you go harvest something else. Yeah, I would just wipe it off really well. That would be enough, probably. Um, 
So I would need a mushroom like that. Cool. I'm gonna get out of this. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit more about Mushroom Festival. And um, Gary is a returning guest. He's one of the people who started the festival. He's been with us for years. He's been um, a really helpful and really um, generous with his time and coming to the festival to offer his knowledge and his experience um, to us. So we're very thankful to have uh, Gary Linkoff as one of the people that is a regular person in our event. Um, one person that, and so the other person that's really popular right now, and you've all heard of him, is Paul Stamets. And I mentioned his book here, um, Growing Gourmet and Medicinal Mushrooms. And you guys had an opportunity to look at that. Um, there's another guy out there that's kind of the East Coast version right now, and he's coming around, and his name is Trad Cotter. He um, did a TEDx presentation. Um, I've been in contact with him for probably six months or more now, maybe eight months. Um, he was suggested to me by the editor of, um, of Fungi Magazine because of his knowledge and his zest for life, his like his understanding of mushrooms and he's really done a tremendous amount of work to kind of bring education to people through many different means and he uses you know YouTube as one of those ways. He does a lot of consulting and whatever like bringing people out to his farm or showing people how to do things. Um, he does a really excellent job with it. Um, he actually won several really great opportunities in his life, and one was the Grow Fellowship through the EPA and a Student Entrepreneur of the Year for his business um, from Clemson University. So this guy is doing some really good things. So he's coming? He's coming. He's going to do three presentations. I'm still trying to work out the details on some of them, but one of them is he wants to do micro microbrewery. Um, there's, you know, we all like beer, well maybe some of us like beer, but um, in this town there's, there's two breweries. Um, the Myco Brewery is a really um, awesome way to understand that there's different types of, of yeasts and fungus that can be used to create different flavors in beers um, and different uh, um, alcohols. So he's going to talk about that and he, he's it's so easy it's from the point that people can do it from their home or they could do it on a large scale like over at Telluride Brewing Company or something. Um, he's going to do another one that's a really awesome low-tech version called Shrooming Off the Grid. It's, a, it's meant for people like you and me to be able to do this at home. How can we incorporate it into different parts of our lives and how easy it is to do it and he's kind of bring that knowledge and we're trying to do that at the mushroom festival this year is trying to offer people things from the beginner level of like cultivation of how to use oyster mushroom mycelium and grow it on coffee grounds or on straw or whatever to shiitake logs um, inoculation of shiitake logs um, or how do you on an intermediate level how to apply those in your own landscape um, or how to use lab techniques to extract cloning um, or to use cloning of the mushrooms you find in the field to grow those in your home. Um, that even goes up to a more advanced level, but there's those opportunities. And Trad's doing this out at his place. I'm doing some of it at my place right now. Um, and Trad is doing this on a massive scale. And so it's really cool. He's got like, you know, international clientele and he's gonna, He's trying to teach people how to do this on their own. So, and then the last one is microremediation for everyone. And I talked about <coughs> microremediation a little bit last month at this presentation. And I'm going to show you a couple things here. Um, he's going to talk about that a little bit more in this presentation here. Um, and then I'm going to show you I'm going to show you this presentation. And I'm going to show you two other really easy ways for you to utilize the mushrooms that you do find throughout the summer this summer um, because there's definitely going to be opportunities for oyster mushrooms to be collected anytime now like if we have enough moisture 
they can sprout out any time in this area. So, um, and those would be growing on aspens or cottonwoods and things like that, but I would suggest looking in a, a field guide to find that out. So, Trad is going to be here this summer. He is really, really um, stepping up to the plate with three presentations. Most people don't do that, but Gary has five, I guess, so. <laughs> what are the dates? It's August 16th through 19th. And in the back of the, on that table back there, I have some cards and some postcards that you can pick up. Um, and then a volunteer list if you're interested in volunteering for the festival. And if you're not, you can put your name on there and I'll contact you anyway and we'll make that happen. Ryan, it looks like uh, it doesn't want to go any further. Maybe it needs a boost. It's probably once you play it. Okay, cool. Well, this, uh, this is Trad Cotter's version of Mushroom Saving the World. And he's going to talk to you about kind of his, what got him to this point um, in his life and his involvement in mushrooms and how to um, utilize them in landscapes and the different ways that we can do that for micro restoration and micro remediation um, to like home cultivation or other types of um, cultivation in natural landscapes or remediation of like microforestry. So I'm gonna show you guys this and then we'll go into something a little easy now we're going to talk to you about the power of mushrooms. It's probably not the power you were hoping for, because <laughs> you look like a pretty hip crowd. But it, is this, you prepare to be amazed about this. Mushrooms, Trad Cotter. Descending fever. A misty morning rides the rain bus to work. Rubber feet and wicker hands hovering beneath the soft canopy of a lost forest. A balancing sense of greed and selflessness. Two species meet. Dichuriotic fusion and molecular handshakes. We are the honeybees in a fungal kingdom, pollinating our coexistence. To find a friend, we must become that friend. Can they teach us survival training? Sometimes I often wonder who's the inferior to a surprisingly superior simplicity. I began my mushroom career cultivating in about 1994. I was a professional cultivator at the age of 20, uh, growing as about 1,000 pounds of shiitake mushrooms a week. But I'll, I wasn't always a mushroom hunter. I was an explorer. Um, I had the uh, ability to travel with my, my family. It was a military background family. We got to explore the Middle East. I was amazed about how big the world was. And I gave up my career as a camel racer <laughs> at the age of nine. I lost my sponsor. And I wasn't very good at it. You can see I'm gripping that thing from front and back. I was terrified. But what I did learn that um, being from a military family is um, I saw a lot of the struggle in the military uh, in the Middle Eastern countries. And uh, half of my family is from a military background and half are farmers. So um, I think where the real struggle is is not between humans. It's our warfare against the planet. And what I'm going to show you today are a few ideas that, I've, that the Mushroom Kingdom has taught me. Uh, I have become the student, and mushrooms are the teacher. I'm first going to show you the real threat that each one of us is guilty of. Axel of evil, <laughs> number one. And we were, all, we were all pushing this Axel of evil around. Uh, it's our food system, our food insecurity right now. It's a major problem on the planet. The average or typical American food store has how many? 40,000 items in those food stores. And all of them are packaged and prepackaged and packages inside the packages, um, plastic. Uh, this is our warfare, not only on our immune systems, but on the planet. 
Uh, we throw away a lot of garbage. The United States, the leading waste producer in the, in the world. Uh, we're becoming importers and exporters of pollution. And this isn't all bad stuff. What does this have to do with mushrooms? We can kidnap or intercept the waste streams of every city, uh, every household, every school, every business, and every city. Uh, this is a composting facility not too far from this building. Um, every city has one. But we can collect and infect all the curbside pickup from every household and business using fungi. And this is our curbside pickup program. It doesn't matter. You just got to get it there. Every country's got one. So he gets an A for effort. But this is my army. Education. Right now, fungi are almost absent, or all but absent, from the, from the curricula, from at grades 12 to high school, even in college. If you look at the textbooks, look to the back. How many pages are devoted to the kingdom fungi? How many of you learned about fungi in grade school? Did I get to raise your hands? Do you even remember? All right. How many of you learned about mushrooms on a Friday night? In college, <laughs> from some guy named Steve. <laughs> Whoever's laughing, uh, we know what you're talking about. But this is what we need to do. We need to reinvent the curriculum. The, the, the kingdom fungi has some powerful tools, not only for recycling, but for feeding the planet. Um, and what I do is I educate uh, children how to grow, how to take ordinary household items, like a cereal box, pencil shavings, pieces of coffee, an egg crate, recyclable egg crate, not styrofoam, and grow mushrooms on it. And just watch them wonder, how is, how is that possible? That you can create food from cardboard boxes, from an old cotton shirt, from your shredded tax documents. Why not? I'm sure the Pentagon, we could probably grow a lot of mushrooms on that waste stream. What do you think? And this, uh, this simplicity that I was describing, this is our environmental stimulus package. We didn't have to go through Congress. And I give you uh, micro-remediation, which is a term, it's a big word, myco meaning mushrooms, remediation uh, for fungi. But mushrooms are capable of breaking down very complex molecules. Think of them as uh, chemical scissors. They take these big molecules of dangerous substances and they can chop them up and break them down. So we turn to fertilizers, which we need to plant our agricultural crops, which is also a major concern. This is Axel of Evil number two. Our agricultural system is broken. We have genetically modified food in the hands of just a few major corporations. We're, we're spreading these fertilizers and pesticides in the soil, practically sterilizing these microbes, these communities. Evolution. These plants have evolved with fungi for millions of years, bonding to the roots of these plants, and yet we're killing them. This is the original carbon trading scheme that's been going on for millions of years. Fungi are giving carbon to the plants, and, uh, excuse me, plants are giving carbon to the fungi, and fungi are giving nitrogen and phosphates to the plants. So what are we doing? We're giving the plants fertilizers, and they're losing that relationship. They're forgetting about the fungi. They're becoming addicted to oil. These fertilizers are derived from natural gas sources. And these same fungi that these kids can grow in coffee and on cardboard boxes can be expanded to other methods here. Uh, this is a, a, a brand new picture from our laboratory here. It's uh, oyster, white oyster mushroom breaking down the herbicide atrazine. Extremely dangerous um, chemical. This is only 0.1 part per billion can cause a sexual mutation in a frog. And this is not what we're doing. Uh, we are spraying this on our yards and our grass. This is at day 10. This fungus touches down 
almost like a lunar landing. It's in an alien landscape, and yet it's patient. It waits, it reprograms its enzymes to sense this toxic environment. And from day 10 to day 12, it is now breaking down and reprogrammed to break down atrazine. Also, we've done the same strain. We've um, actually kind of a torture chamber in our laboratory for mushrooms. We've uh, adapted these and trained them to grow on motor oil. And there's no other food source here. So how is this possible? Uh, but imagine the implications of taking these fungi, um, growing them out on cardboard, a cardboard that would normally go to the landfill. 30 to 40 percent of our waste is paper or cardboard. We can kidnap that colonize it at our local processing facilities and mix it in with all of the contaminated debris that's coming out of our households. Um, this is a recent experiment of us growing uh, mushrooms on jeans. I had the pleasure of wearing these out to a party one day with mushrooms growing out all over my body. <laughs> Actually, it's a decolorizing indigo carmine. So this holds a lot of potential. There's a lot of textile mills up here. There's a lot of brown fields around the world that could be we could use this technology. So now we get into mycoforestation, using mushrooms to heal the environment. Without a healthy environment, we don't have a healthy food system, and we don't have good health. Uh, we're robbing carbon from the forest at an alarming rate. It takes over 600 years to make one inch of soil. If you look on the United Nations uh, website, right now soil is becoming an endangered species. It's getting thinner and thinner and soon incapable of supporting plant life, which we rely on. Mushrooms are soil creators. We can take this waste and debris and create soil where there is no soil. So if Earth was a bank, we're making some huge withdrawals to the point where they probably sent us a few notices in the mail, but do we even care? Do we even notice? We just keep on withdrawing. So this is our Earth bank. It's about to shut down. But with our help from the fungal kingdom, we can inject new hope and new life. Not only soil, but food to restabilize the food system, the food security around the planet. Soils devoid of topsoil do not hold water. They can't hold water, they can't support life. So this is my challenge for everybody today. Uh, everybody's going to get one of these on your way out. This is a very small fragment of a mushroom. This is inside this bag is a mushroom. This is the life cycle in here. It never wants to become a mushroom. This is perfectly happy being in the state that it is. But you can take this one bag just like this, the size of a fragment, mix it with coffee, mix it with cardboard, and expand it. And if you don't have time to do this, give it to someone who can. Give it to a child. Give it to someone in college. Send it overseas. Within 10 days, you've got 10 bags. You split those 10 bags up at a factor of 10, and then you graduate up to a 5-gallon bucket. When you fill a 5-gallon bucket, this will spread through the 5-gallon bucket. As many as 20,000 miles of this fungus is in a 5-gallon bucket. And each one of these buckets can in turn infect cardboard. This cardboard can be rolled up, colonized, and sent to foreign nations who don't have soil, who don't have food, who are getting desperate, and desperate people do desperate things. We can drag water hyacinth, one of the fastest growing plants on the planet, dry it, and use our mushroom cultures from our five gallon bucket. Using reusable containers in primitive Humidity tents, we can grow mushrooms within about three weeks. Edible protein, no fertilizer, no chemicals. Relying on indigenous plant species, whether it's in Africa or Asia. And these mushrooms are very high in protein. They contain a lot of selenium, and selenium inhibits the HIV virus. Africa could really use an injection of mushroom protein right now. These are mushroom pots stacked at one of our um, test farms, and these in turn become filters. These uh, pots are all stacked up, as you can see just like this, um, in little, they're all fused together, but the water can be percolated through these systems as well to create living filtration systems. 
that can strip out mercury, that can strip out lead, that can strip out herbicides and pesticides. And this is a beautiful thing. Edible protein, as much as 250% biological efficiency from something that we normally wouldn't eat, something that we would normally throw in the landfill. And this is a two-day time lapse from the size of a quarter to the size of a, a very large grapefruit. Edible protein for free. These can be broken down with worms. Uh, once you've picked your mushrooms, that media that's inside there, the spent hyacinth or banana fronds, uh, then you introduce worms, and now you've created soil. You could feed the worms to chickens, now you have another source of protein. Then you could use the manure from the chickens to help fertilize the yards. And there's the soil creation, all in about 11 weeks, not 600 years. That soil can be used to plant gardens on these primitive structures. This vegetable waste that you see growing over one of our greenhouses can be dried, and that can be used to create edible protein. So we've created a circular system, a perpetual food system, and this can be applied to rooftop gardens where there is no land, where they have no contact or no soil. And these bales here, uh, they hold a lot of water, so it's almost a waterless system. Mushrooms create heat, carbon dioxide, and water, a perfect companion for a plant. And this is my parking garage style garden here. I've stacked wheat bales, old dried material, and inoculated it with our oyster mushrooms. And why not go a step further? Take those mushrooms that you grow. Take spore prints. These are the seeds of the mushrooms here. And you can scrape them up, inoculate some bird seed, and let the birds spread these seeds and spores all over the world. These are my fighter jets. I've declared war on the planet. It's a good war. And here are my stealth bombers. <laughs> so again, um, we are taking way too much carbon from the planet. And in closing, uh, we've got to recreate this paradise. We've got to recreate soil. Evolution does not take a million years. It can happen today. It can happen tonight. So as you go to bed tonight, you start thinking about mushrooms and having mushroom dreams. Take that little packet and see how far you can go. Thank you. Awesome. So that guy is a pretty good visionary there. <clears throat> Has a really excellent <clears throat> view of how to utilize mushrooms um, and bring it to the people. He's got some really good ideas that are easy to implement and re really simple. The, the key, the only difficult part is really just trying to get the spawn. And so um, the spawn meaning like the mycelium, the fragments of mycelium in order to grow them. And so um, if you were to go out and collect mushrooms, let's say you're gonna go out and collect like oyster mushrooms or even morels or whatever, um, then you can grow them if you have the right conditions, conditions mm -hmm. to do that in. And so here are two really cool ideas. This is the blue, it's called Lapista Nuda. It's a bluish, purplish mm -hmm. colored mushroom, pinkish in some places. I mean, just kind of it's more purplish blue, let's say. Um, and it doesn't have a rusty brown spore print. And the bluet is a really cool mushroom. Um, it likes complex environments that are that have like bacteria and detritus that it can break down, like cellulose and lignin that come from plant fibers. So um, I want to show you this video as well. It's a really awesome video to something you can do to help spread spores all over the place. I don't know if this one has to be. This is an idea we came up with when we were messing around with the, the stem butt uh, cardboard technique. Instead of putting them on cardboard, I uh, just decided to put them in a blender. All the stem butts, uh, soil and all, and lacerate them in a blender. And what you have is a slurry 
and you add water to that slurry and we froze it and what you get is this frozen cocktail of living spores and mycelium and it's just full of mycelium wood chips chunks and it's all alive the bluet does not mind being frozen that's why it likes to fruit during the rent during the winter and uh, what we like to do is place this bluet bomb right on top of the compost pile like this and as this uh, starts to melt all the mycelium the fragments and the spores and the bacteria just drench this compost pile very slowly and it's going to start tacking all this cellulose waste um, we've got some corn cotton waste paper bags all that so it speeds up the compost pile generates heat and then it becomes a big bluet bomb for the rest of your yard all the compost you use will have bluet mycelium spreading throughout your yard does that seem pretty simple yeah. <laughs> you just have to trust that your blender is not going to explode but, um, and then I want to show you this last one this is much more towards the style of things that we can do easily in the home but you know the last one was pretty easy but this one's pretty nice too What I'm about to show you is a technique called stem bud um, cultivation. And these bluets are a perfect species because the, the mycelium around the base of these regenerates very easily. So when you find bluets like this, like we did today, when you're cleaning them for the kitchen, save the, uh, save the bottoms, part of the stem. And what I've done is soak corrugated par uh, cardboard in a pot regular cardboard and it comes a, comes apart in sheets and all you need to do is cut these stems cut the stem base off just like that so you get the very bottom what I do is I chop it into pieces into these little cubes and you're just going to kind of lay them out got a bunch ready here to go break them up a little bit. Now you're going to make a burrito, a bullet burrito right here. I'm just going to take it and pretty tightly just going to roll it up. Just like that. Nice and tight. And what that fungus is going to do, it's going to start feeding on the cardboard get a Ziploc bag, usually a one gallon. That doesn't come apart. So now you've made a little blue burrito. Now, a couple months ago, I've made one here, and we'll put the pictures up so you can see the close-ups. But inside these sheet is turned Wow, look at that. It's totally white. Totally white. It's completely taken over this cardboard. Now you can bury this whole sheet in the mulch or you can put it in your compost pile and eventually you will get more bluets. Easy. So the blue burrito is a really excellent thing you can do at your house. If you have a garden, you can use that for sheet mulch. And then if you put a little bit of uh, wood chips or sawdust or something over that or whatever mulch you like to use, <coughs> you, you can use that in your garden for it to move around um, and keep the moisture in the soil so it doesn't just start to evaporate and dry out. So um, <coughs> Mushroom Festival this year on Thursday uh, is going to be mostly about cultivation and remediation. It's going to be um, a really excellent opportunity for people to learn how to how to utilize mushrooms and mushroom mycelium in their daily life um, in many different ways. And there's going to be hands-on presentations where people can get their hands dirty doing just that right there, or growing mushroom mycelium on straw, or learning how to uh, you know inoculate logs with different types of mycelium. That's one level of thing, and I wanted to bring that to you tonight. So um, this is. One of the gentlemen who are going to who who's going to present at the.
festival. Um, another person who's going to present is Anna McHugh. She presented right in this room at Mushroom Festival last year. Um, she has a website called Crazy About Mushrooms. Um, she's a radio journalist, and so she has a finished documentary. Um, I always think she looks a little bit like you, Robin. No. <laughs> I'm like, that, every time I see a picture, I'm like, that's Robin. But it's <laughs> always, you know. But uh, she, she learned about mushrooms um, and did some work with Paul Stamets in mycofiltration. And she's looking for a place to do a um, micro-remediation project in Telluride. And currently she has a, two projects going on. Her projects are um, working on extracting the heavy metals in the, the, from the uh, extraction of gold in mine tailing piles and stuff. So she's really trying to work with phytoremediation and introducing three or four different types of mycelium into that and she's looking for a place. So if you guys know of a place, somebody has a mine tailing in their backyard that you know is on their property, um, she's looking we for a place to start a project like that we here have, this summer. We have some lead tailings right next to the river that, well, that could use something. Right. The private landowners would have probably an easier time doing it than if it was on like public land because you have to go through a different process. But um, it's a good place to start a test up here to try some of these things. And last year I put on a presentation of exactly about that, just trying to get people for the Paul Stamets. Um, that was a UCSM thing too, right? A joint so, thing. Yeah. The Bioneers program here at the library. So um, we talked about ways that we can utilize mushrooms in remediating um, the environmental effects of mining. And, um, you know, Trad Cotter's doing that, Anna McHugh's doing that. I've got a couple little projects that I've started that are going on down valley, um, and there's more to come. So if you come to Mushroom Festival this year, you have the opportunity to learn how to do these things um, in your yard or for your community or for the watershed. Are there any questions about anything that was presented tonight or anything else? Okay. Feel free to take one of these cards um, from the back, from the table, and if you're interested in volunteering at Shroom Fest, there's a sign-up sheet there, and I can get in contact with you uh, through that method. So, cool. Thank you for coming, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.